the things that I valued most suddenly disappeared from my life and I didn't really have any of the things I'd organized myself around to stabilize me. So there was a period of great instability before I could find something else to commit myself to. There isn't a simple formula, but there are several elements, I think. People need a lot of support from others, and they need to be helped to see that change doesn't necessarily always mean uh, only loss, that with every loss there's an opportunity. For example, I could not conceive of, of living in a wheelchair as being a bearable situation for me because all I could conceive of was what I had lost. But then when I began to recognize the opportunities that were available to me, then life began to change for me. Loss in the way that I've been thinking of it has to do with anything around which a person organizes his life. The things that give his life meaning and give him a reason for getting up in the morning. And it can be a physical function, it can be an ideal, it can be an occupation, uh, it can be a loved one. Sadness and emptiness are the two most prominent feeling states. Uh, there are the stages that have often been described by others having to do with denial, um, rage, depression, blaming, and bargaining, and ultimately, hopefully, acceptance. It's almost a necessity for a person to deny the loss of something important when it first happens. For example, the reaction when a loved one is lost almost always is, oh no, that can't be. Because one can't conceive of, of life without that person, that thing, that occupation, whatever, that has been so important in his life. So denial is a stabilizing, necessary force. But it can become a problem if somebody remains arrested in the stage of denial. And sometimes one sees that where someone will insist that there is no other life. And for example, someone I know, his dog that he had uh, loved dearly died recently. And he told me about how everyone said to him, well, just get another dog. And he said, I don't want another dog. I want the dog I've lost. The amount of pain or loss that a person feels uh, can't be quantified in any objective way. The person experiences the degree of pain that he experiences. And it may be something that consensually people would say would be minor. But still, it may be more painful than one might ordinarily think. Why would anyone want to accept the loss of something important and meaningful? There'd be no reason unless he had acquired something to take its place. So I began to think about stages of acquisition, how one uh, began to acquire something new that could replace what had been lost. Not an easy task. The first thing has to do with rejection. That is, rejection goes along with denial. 
where one rejects any other possibilities. The person wants what he had before, and he can't conceive of any other possibility. Time is a very important factor. Support from others is an important factor. And trying to live one day at a time, I think, is also important. Because when, when one looks too far ahead, and all one can know is what he already knows, you know, so you don't know what the opportunities may become. So you look ahead, and it looks like there's nothing there. So if you can go one day at a time, and not foreclose the future, leave it open, I think one is better off. The next stage has to do with developing some openness, and often it's helped by being able to see that there are other opportunities, by seeing how people in the same situation may have coped. That's where peer groups may be very valuable. I am the wife of John Russell, who was a patient at Cabot Kaiser with Arnie. My Johnny was sent there because he had, he was on a standby, he needed a standby respirator, or he would have been sent to the uh, veterans. They were using the Kenny packs at that time, and he, my, my John was all wrapped up. And he, uh, he says, well, before you do anything, he says, go down the, uh, go down the ward and see if there's a guy named Bill Hayes. He says, there's a voice that's driving me crazy. So I went down, and sure enough, there was Bill Hayes, who was my, Johnny's, roommate in college. He had picked up polio the same week. And so we went through the, all the training. He, he had a wife, Hel, uh, Evelyn, and she was expecting her second child. I was expecting my first child, so we went through the pregnancies together. Arnie was the sickest one in the ward. And I met Rita and Arnie once they were married. Then we formed what we called the polio group. And so we would play bridge and have dinner, and we would go from house to house. So we had a lot of fun. We played duplicate, and uh, Arnie always considered himself not a very good bridge player, but he was a very good bridge player. If one has a very narrow view of what is acceptable, it's possible to screen out a lot of opportunities. So remaining open to the possibilities is important. Ultimately, the task is to acquire something new in the way of a hope and a dream. I think there's a frequently a misunderstanding about what independence is. Independence does not have to do with being isolated and doing everything for yourself, but rather being able to rely on the available resources and people that there are in the world. The person who is truly dependent is the one who relies and is willing to rely on only one person or one thing. That narrows his opportunities and makes him quite dependent. Independence is really an openness to the various things that may be useful. Life is filled with loss as well as opportunity. We don't talk as much these days about good sportsmanship as we might. Yes. And being a graceful loser is certainly as important as being a winner, maybe more important. The, the, the phrase, where there's a will, there's a way, I think is fine insofar as it encourages people to try to find ways out. Uh, insofar as it becomes a blaming mechanism, I think it's a problem. Sometimes uh, in frustration, people who want to help but find themselves unable will, will blame the, the victim for not trying harder. And I've heard that is used in that light. I've never been able to motivate anyone. But I have been able to understand what people's own motives are. 
and what push what drives them forward and then if you can work with a person towards discovering how they can achieve some constructive meaningful end with the motivation that they have uh, that's been useful I think and it's been important for me an example for me would be I had so much energy uh, that was blocked uh, from my athletic participation. And then when I was unable to move, I didn't know what to do with it. I, I, was, I wasn't really a fan in the sense that I collected statistics like a lot of people. So I almost had to force myself to become a fan, and it allowed me to get some of the satisfactions in a vicarious way that I did. And then that interest began to mature in a strange and unexpected way. Uh, as I began to enter my profession and began to try to understand how people thought and behaved, uh, I began to apply that to the athletic observations that I was making. And then, quite to my surprise, I became a consultant to various teams and athletes and athletic organizations. And it was like being reborn again. And that's related to this whole matter of the athlete and the cripple. That, that everyone who values his body and who seeks to hypertrophy it, make it stronger, also has within him something that he's overcoming, and that is the weakling, the cripple, if I can put it that way. And so, in a strange way, to my surprise, I found that, that athletes were quite comfortable with me for the most part. I never had one who wasn't. In fact, they saw in me someone who had, in a sense, faced their worst fears. Uh, many of the athletes I worked with were people who were not performing as well as they thought. They were athletes with great skill and natural ability, but somehow were not meeting their objectives, were not becoming as good as they could be. So they saw in me someone who could understand that process. I often have been asked questions like, how do I bear being unable to move? Or how can I stand it? Uh, the question always seemed kind of interesting to me. How do I? But I was never able to answer the question because I realize now that it wasn't what I was involved with. What I was attending to was something of an affirmative nature, something that interested me. Like, for example, if I were with a patient, and I was with the patient, and I was absorbed in whatever interaction we were having, or in trying to understand what was going on with the patient. So I wasn't thinking about what it was like to be disabled. When one thinks about being disabled, what's on his mind is what he can't do. And when I'm thinking about what I can't do and my deficiencies, that's a very depressing uh, thing for me. And I don't feel absorbed in life. But when things outside myself interest me, and I can get involved in them, then I'm not aware of being disabled. So it's, it's really a matter of attention. I don't really think of it in terms of spirit or courage, but rather whether one can find things in life that are interesting that he can commit himself to. And I've been fortunate that I've been able to do that. He had a way of turning things around. I remember one day he told me that uh, Someone asked him, what's it like to be so limited in a wheelchair? And he said, well, I can't answer that question. In fact, I won't answer that question because it'll put me in a different consciousness. 
But I'll tell you what I'll do. If you want to ask me all the things I can do in a wheelchair, I'll be glad to tell you. Humor has certainly been a lifesaver for me. Uh, first of all, it lightens the darkness. When things look hopeless, if one can see the underside of it, the funny side of it, uh, that can be very supportive. But secondarily, humor is constructed of two things, of an obvious side and an underside. So if one can see the humorous side, it means that you begin to be open to more opportunities. And you can see things from different perspectives. One of the things that has been so important is to have something that I can hold on to that has some meaning. We were talking earlier about what uh, the experience of loss of teaching was like. I was teaching residents in psychiatry and they spent two days a week here with me so I didn't have to go in. And when I was no longer able to teach because I didn't have enough air to speak, uh, I really had a feeling of being bereft for a time. I missed it. Uh, it was one of the reasons I got up in the morning. And uh, then I started writing and that was something of a substitute for me. So there's always some opportunity, I think. living in a wheelchair has helped me to recognize both the, the common human qualities of all people and the uniqueness of everyone. And I think I'm a more compassionate person because of it. <laughs>